I want to uh, welcome everyone to this installment of our Berean Torah study. And tonight we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 7 and uh, verses 9 through 17. This will uh, finish off chapter 7. And it's uh, primarily involving the what I would call the multitude of the redeemed. So let's go ahead and, and begin with uh, our Torah blessing. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam. Asher kiddishanu b'mitzvotah b'tzivanu l'asok bedivrei Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us with his commands and commands us to engross ourselves in words of Torah. All right. Good deal. Now, um, so tonight we will uh, be... Um, starting in, uh, like I said, chapter 7 and verses 9 through 17. I wanted to kind of do a, a review of chapter 6 a little bit because um, that would kind of help you get, um, um, get kind of oriented to, uh, how, you know, what, uh, what we're, uh, what we're uh, doing tonight. And, um, Remember in chapter six, we started out with these four angels and they were holding back the four winds of the earth. And, and uh, uh, we looked at the, the winds as being God's judgment uh, against, uh, against the world. And uh, in this uh, other, the verses of chapter, uh, for beginning verses of chapter six, we see that God had set aside 144,000 uh, from the tribes of uh, of Israel for uh, protection, and these uh, 44 tribes, they I mean, uh, uh, 12 tribes, they listed all of the 12 tribes, and guess what? The tribe of Dan and the tribe of Ephraim, uh, the half tribe of Ephraim, uh, were missing from this list, and we went through there that how the reason that they were uh, probably were missing was that. Uh, they had a problem with idolatry, much more so than any of the other tribes, especially Dan did. And then, of course, Ephraim is the, was the largest of the of the tribes in the northern uh, northern kingdom, uh, and um, so they and they obviously they definitely had a problem with with uh, uh, with uh, idolatry. And then I went through. A um, kind of a scenario of the lost tribes uh, not being so lost, and that uh, the uh, nation of Israel we know was split up after Solomon's death, and uh, then uh, the northern uh, tribes. Well, actually, uh, after Solomon's death, uh, Rehoboam came to power. He was Solomon's son, and uh, he was going to carry on. A lot of the uh, high taxes, well, in fact, he was going to pile on, uh, double down on the high taxes and the um, forced labor that uh, his father Solomon had used all throughout Israel. And it was a heavy, heavy burden on the people of Israel. And uh, so uh, Rehoboam's, uh, or the, the advisors of, of Solomon, who were now the advisors to Rehoboam, told him, uh, Let's uh, it said the people have had enough. We've built the, uh, the temple. We've built up the the uh, fortifications all throughout Israel. Uh, the major one in Megiddo was built up, and and so um, it's about time to let lo uh, let off a little bit. Let's lower taxes and uh, do away with the um, with the forced labor. Well, then. Um, uh, Rehoboam's uh, other advisors, uh, his peers, guys that were his age, uh, said, oh, no, you don't want to do that. We want to uh, keep on going and make your name great and and uh, do all these uh, construction things and and uh, increase your uh, your wealth and keep those taxes going. In fact, make it even worse. And um, so as a result of that, um, the, co the country was split. There was a civil war. And... Um, uh, Jeroboam led uh, the 10 northern tribes and um, headquartered himself up in, uh, in the, uh, the 
area that was allocated to uh, Dan. And uh, in fact, uh, that's the name of the city that uh, he he set up his kingdom in or his, uh, his headquarters was in Dan. And uh, I explained how that there are the ruins, the, the foundation actually are still there for a temple that he had set up, uh, a counterfeit temple. And then he also set up a, a counterfeit uh, um, altar and, you know, things that were just a mimic of what was in Jerusalem because he wanted people not to go to Jerusalem because he was afraid that that would um, hinder his his control of the of the uh, tribes up there. But um, um, now and Rehoboam was, of course, he he was left down in, in uh, Jerusalem and he was king over Judah and uh, Benjamin, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin. And uh, the Levites, a lot of the Levites were in Jerusalem uh, and, the, and the surrounding areas of Jerusalem. And uh, um, so um, that was, uh, that's how they were divided up. The, the northern tribes were led into, uh, into idolatry by Jeroboam. You know, I mean, how how much further? Uh, I mean, how much of a more of a leap would it have been? Because Jeroboam had already set up this uh, counterfeit uh, temple and a counterfeit altar and all the makings of what would have been uh, the you know the type of sacrifice. But then remember, that God said, "Don't do sacrifices anywhere." Uh, except where I put my name. And of course, he put his name in Jerusalem. So the only place that you could do um, the uh, sacrifices were uh, in in Jerusalem. And uh, so um, the uh, Jeroboam led the people into idolatry. And of course, this idolatry led to... Uh, um, eventually their their uh, exile. But in the meantime, when he started all of this, there were still devout people in all of the tribes, all these northern tribes, that they looked at this and they said, you know, this this is just not right, and uh, we're we're just not going to put up with this. We <clears throat> obviously we're we can't fight against the <clears throat> the king. So a lot of people just packed up and moved south. Um, the uh, the Levites, the Bible uh, specifically says that the Levites who were devout and they looked at this, they were try they were being forced um, into this false worship, this idol worship, and so uh, they uh, they rebelled against that and said, no, we're not going to do that. And so the Levites packed up everything that they had, meager as it was, and they moved south also. Uh, you remember that uh, Levites were not given an inheritance like the other tribes were. They were only given uh, a 1,500-foot uh, a belt around each of the, the cities where they had. There were six uh, sanctuary cities that were Levitical cities. And uh, then other places uh, where Levites had established themselves. But God had given them 1,500 feet around the, the city for them to grow their crops and and uh, run their their uh, whatever cattle that they may have, so that they could help sustain themselves, and so that's the only um, only inheritance that they had. And yet, what they did was they were devout enough that they gave it all up. They packed everything up that they that they owned, and they moved um, moved down toward Jerusalem. So. Um, then in, uh, 721 BCE, uh, the Assyrian King, uh, Sargon, uh, he defeated Israel and, and, uh, deported about five to 7% of the, of the people of Israel. And generally these were the educated ones. These were the, uh, any type of, uh, uh, that they, they considered royalty or, uh, you know the upper crust anyway. These were the upper uh, upper crust of of uh, of the northern tribes. They gathered them all up and took them out. So um, 
you know, that left uh, 93 to 95% of the of Israel intact. And so uh, typical of the, the Assyrians, they would send in a bunch of uh, their own Assyrian folks with the express purpose of, of uh, uh, assimilating the, the conquered people into their way of thinking and their way of life. And uh, it, they, evidently they were pretty successful because uh, we uh, now know that the, the um, northern tribes, they intermarried with the Assyrians. And uh, now that's uh, in Yeshua's day, that's what they call Samaritans. And the Jews would have nothing to do with it because they thought they were an impure race. Um, from the seven, or from 930 BCE to 721 BCE, um, uh, uh, like I said, a lot of people immigrated from the north and uh, came down uh, south to uh, Judah. So during that, you know, it's uh, roughly uh, 200 years. A lot of people came back. There, there are a lot of uh, biblical texts. I think I went through five last week that uh, recorded things about the the tribes that uh, the names of the tribes that were they were still alive and well in uh, in um, Judah and as well as you know when the when Judah was then captured I mean when Jerusalem was in uh, captured by uh, Nebuchadnezzar the Babylonians they uh, they took them away to Babylon and uh, yet they in Babylon they were able to retain their tribal identity. And so that when they came back, the Bible does record uh, some of the tribes and so forth that did come back. And, and in this description, they uh, described, they mentioned um, the Northern tribes, some of the Northern tribes, they mentioned some from Ephraim and Manasseh, Zebulon, um, Issachar, uh, and uh, well, there were there were several of them, and I don't I don't think that they probably listed all of them. But what they did list was enough of the the people that it gives me the the uh, impression that you know the, these folks still knew who their tribes were, and they knew their their family affiliations. So before we uh, go any further, any uh, any questions on uh, any of that? I just unmuted everybody if you wanted to uh, to say something. Any uh, anything that uh, anyone has? Okay, then uh, we'll continue on. Now, um, let's go ahead and read Revelation 7, uh, 9 to 10. Okay, now Michael did, did pop something out here on the chat. Uh, he said, I've read in recently published articles on the Internet that many Jews can trace genetic and ge uh, genealogical links to their ancestral tribes. That includes Levites and other tribes. I know that you can do it with Levi because uh, uh, I did that for myself, and uh, I I am, um, you know, according to the genetic markers and everything, uh, that I fall into the category of being from the tribe of Levi. So I know that you can you can do it that far. Um, and I believe that it uh, that was proven through my mother's side. Uh, so uh, I don't know about my uh, my dad's side, uh, but uh, that I knew that uh, that the Levite part I, I couldn't prove anything of it or didn't didn't have proof of it until then um, I uh, I got the DNA stuff uh, done for, through my mother's side. So yeah, I I know they can do it from. Uh, uh, to Levi, I didn't know about any of the other uh, any of the other tribes and the clans. Okay, so let's go ahead with um, Revelation. Um, okay, it says where'd you do this at to find out your heritage? The DNA testing. Okay, I did that through 
FamilyTreeDNA.com, I think it is. Um, they're a, actually they're a, they're a company right here in Houston. I think the guy that runs the thing is uh, his last name is Greenberg. So uh, some people are trying to use that for for Aliyah, and uh, yeah, let uh, you might look it up and and see uh, if that's that's what it is. But I think that's what it was. It was a family tree DNA, and it's either dot com or dot org. But um, I, I'm assuming that it's dot com because it's a commercial enterprise. Okay, so, uh, Revelation 7, 9 through 10. Um, After these things I looked, and behold, a vast multitude that no one could count, from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues, uh, was standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Okay, um, John, you know, he, he, sees a, he sees another vision here. And um, I think a lot of people will kind of gloss over just these first couple of three words there. It says, after these things. And you'll see the after these things a couple of times in Revelation. And uh, to me, he was talking about the first, the six seals that were opened up, a scene that was up in the, up in the throne room of heaven. And um, then he says, after these things, meaning I, I think after the six seals were, were opened up, um, that uh, this refers to me to the, to the end or, you know, at, at least the middle of the tribulation and on toward the end. And so it says that there was a, a, a vast, um, vast multitude of believers, and that it was so big that no, it says no one could count how many thousands upon thousands there were. I mean, who, who knows? It could have been millions upon millions of um, of people. And uh, these uh, these are believers. We'll get into it a little bit more before the uh, lesson ends tonight. It says every nation, all tribes, tongues, and peoples and tongues. Okay, what the what that tells me is that uh, these are. I mean, this this is everybody. This is not just Jews. And um, um, I reject the notion that this is uh, where it says uh, believers. That uh, they said, well, this is the church. And um, Jews need not apply because this is those that are, are believers. And, and of course, the, the assumption is that if you are a believer then, uh, in, in Yeshua, then you have already given up all your Judaism uh, foolishness. And uh, now you are a, a card carrying whatever, you know, from, uh, from, uh, Catholic to Protestant to uh, you know whatever whatever the the brand name that you uh, would be, but um, I think what uh, my reading on this thing is that it is a, a multitude of of uh, believers, uh, no matter what your ethnicity, and it says that it's you know every nation, all tribes, peoples, and tongues, and uh, nobody could count them. And what was uh, struck me was the idea of that, uh, that uh, said, you know, if it was every nation, every tribe, every language, well, then that meant that, uh, guess what? There's going to be, it's, it's going to be um, a very diverse um, crowd up in heaven because uh, it, it's just like, um, I don't know uh, what you would, but what we should have to here on earth, I mean, it, it, when you get right down to it, we should have congregations where everyone can worship freely together, uh, no matter what uh, what your ethnic background, whether you you know you come from the Middle East or Africa or Asia or um, uh, you know anywhere else in the in the world. And uh, I started to say Antarctica, but I don't think we allow penguins in the kingdom. So 
Um, <laughs> the, uh, the idea that, um, well, uh, Australasians. Now, there's a, there's a term for you, Australasians. Uh, that would be folks from, uh, you know, the uh, Polynesian cultures and New Guinea and, and all of that kind of stuff. So what it does, it tells me that, okay, this is for everybody. But what else it tells me is that once we, uh, you know, the Bible says that our, our bodies will be changed in the twinkling of an eye, but evidently they're not going to change enough that uh, we lose our individuality, that we are still going to be um, recognizable. And uh, I think uh, uh, my wife is, is really into big, uh, really big into reading a lot of these um, books uh, that people have a near-death experience and they, they uh, go up into heaven and then they come back and, and relate their, their uh, story as to what they saw. And uh, uh, we've happened to know, uh, uh, personally known a couple of folks that uh, have, that has happened to, one of them being our grandson and uh, then another being a, a pastor's wife. And so uh, they and and uh, the pastor's wife uh, did tell us, and some of these other ones have told us that yeah, when you get to heaven, you're going to be known. Uh, just however you, uh, you people are going to know who you are, and so there's going to be something there that's going to that's going to change a little bit because okay, um, some people are going to uh, they're going to die when they're real young, other people are going to die when they're real old. And so somehow there's going to be a recognition factor in there. But um, we do know that we're going to retain some kind of uh, ethnicity in, in heaven, because how else would John have been able to look over this big crowd and see uh, you know, people from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues uh, he, you know, they, they weren't, uh, yes, I was looking at some of the, the, uh, some uh, pictures on the internet. I was trying to find some stuff, you know, to make this a little bit more interesting and, and colorful and so forth. And, uh, um, I found uh, a lot of pictures that showed this vast multitude before the throne of God. And, uh, guess what? I mean, you never saw so many blonde-haired, blue-eyed folks in all your life. And so um, I don't know what happened to all of us that are gray-headed and have uh, green eyes, uh, but uh, that's, it just seemed the, the way that the artists would do that. And then there were a couple of them that got it and that they, they did uh, post a, a, you know, a picture of, of people of you know every people of color of whatever color whatever shade you know um, um, yeah. how's that uh, uh, red and yellow black and white they are precious any sight something like that um, and uh, so we will have an identity we'll have an ethnicity and uh, we will. Um, you know, we will retain our individuality. We're not going to be a, a cookie cutter stamp that, okay, when you change uh, uh, from this mortal being into an immortal being, then all of a sudden you become a um, uh, believer number, you know, whatever, 3,467,000. Uh, and uh, that's your number. No, you're still going to be known as... Uh, uh, Lisa and Christy and Alan and Deborah, whoever it's going to be, uh, that's whoever you are today. That's who you're going to be in uh, in uh, the world to come. And uh, except for now, uh, remember where it said that we would be given a new name. So in addition to our old name, we'll have us uh, have us a new name uh, also. All right. Um, let me let me stop there. Any any questions or comments or anything that that anyone might might have? Okay, going going gone. All right. Now let's uh, let's continue on. 
they were, um, it says they were standing before the throne dressed in white. Now, um, throughout the Bible, the, the color of white is to, it, it uh, you know, it means purity. Now, and remember in Revelation, um, Okay, so there's a question here. Now, let me go ahead and do that question before I continue on. From what I know about the book of Revelation, will we go through the tribulation when, uh, okay, and I'll, uh, yes, okay. Um, I believe that the believers will go through the tribulation, that this so-called rapture or, or you know, um, calling away, um, is not going to take place until the end because what is all of this the scriptures keep talking about those who endure to the end um and so we went through a couple of a uh, couple of weeks ago i think talking about um the examples uh maybe well i think maybe it was last week the examples of how god has uh in the past protected people not out of the situation but through the situation um, if we look at, uh, at um, say, uh, Noah, that's the classic one that everybody wants to talk about. Uh, said, see, Noah was saved from the flood. No, Noah was saved through the flood. He went, still went through it, and he lived on a stinky old boat for a year with uh, thousands of stinky old animals. And... Um, um, just remember, folks, that uh, they didn't have, uh, you know, plumbing on these these arcs, and they had uh, critters like warthogs. One of the nastiest things that was ever ever created, and skunks, and uh, you know, all sorts of other things that were, you know, they're they're just not very. Well, they're they're quite odiferous, but they're certainly not uh, pleasantly so. So uh, you know, Noah had to go through that, and he was uh, and and also you imagine getting on that barge, uh, you know, the boat, the ship, that uh, the, the ark there. Um, it was uh, it was uh, pretty much shaped like a bathtub, you know, just a square box like a big old barge. And I can tell you from my years at sea that uh, that type of uh, of design will uh, it it's uh, while it may float, uh, it's not going to be pleasant. It, it's just got a motion to it that, uh, uh, and especially they had no no propulsion. So even a even a, a well designed a real slick ship uh, with good lines and everything, if it doesn't have propulsion. And it is going to uh, bounce around a good bit. And so this arc was, was going to be like that. It would have been horrible and uh, no windows. Um, it would have been dark in there. So Noah, he was he went through the flood. He didn't go out of the flood. And so the um, uh, same thing uh, with, uh, say, the, the children of Israel in Egypt uh, when uh, you know, throughout all of the plagues, you know, God didn't pull them out of Egypt and then throw in the plagues. No, these plagues were the, right there. They were amongst them. But what did God do? He protected Israel from the effects of the of the plagues. When it was so pitch dark in, in um, Egypt that um, the people couldn't see their hand in front of their face. And the, it says that they... Um, they didn't venture out of their houses for three days because it was it was so dark. They were afraid to get out. They could not get out of their house. So um, that was, again, a place where God didn't pull Israel out of Egypt and then do his uh, uh, do his plagues. No, they were there. The, the, the final plague where the the Passover angel, the angel of death uh, went across Egypt, the um, the Jews, the Israelites were there, and uh, they were not taken out. They had to put the blood on the doorpost. They had to obey God and and do what He asked them to do. 
So therefore, um, they uh, uh, they escaped the penalty of uh, death for their firstborn. But God didn't take them out of Egypt. He didn't take them out of the liability and the possibility of death. <clears throat> uh, no, they had to actually do something. And then they went through that. They, they were not to go out of their homes that night and and uh, so forth. So they went through. They were not taken out of it. So um, I, you know, I just I just don't go along with the idea of a pre-tribulation rapture. Let's look back at uh, at some of these um, um, things we looked at in uh, the congregation in Sardis. So what did it, uh, it, it talked about them, you know, they were, they would be dressed in white and there, I gave you the references there so you can look them up if, if you want to. Um, I'm, I'm not going to take the time to read all of these tonight. The congregation in uh, uh, Laodicea, um, or if you're from Texas, you might say it, Laodicea, but uh, Laodicea, uh, they were told to dress in white. Remember, because in Laodicea, uh, they had a famous product from there. It was a wool from these black goats. And uh, the, so a lot of people wore black. And of course, those people that did, that did that, a lot of them, they were pagans and they, they participated in a lot of stuff that uh, they were not supposed to. So um, Yeshua was telling them, okay, look, separate yourself from those guys and dress in white. And uh, then uh, Revelation 4.4, 4, we've already gone through that part, uh, records that the elders, the 24 elders that were around the throne of God in the, in the throne room, says they were dressed in white. So um, what does this, uh, I don't know, what kind of what does this, oh, there's one more there. Uh, the martyrs under the, the um, altar, uh, when the, the fifth seal was opened, they were all dressed in white. And that's Revelation 6 and 11. All right. Now, in, in uh, the Bible, uh, colors, you know, colors represent certain things. Okay. And this is not always, this is not an, uh, an exclusive list or it's not one that, okay, every time you see this color, that means this or that and the other. But here, generally speaking, these are the colors that, that uh, you know, blue represents uh, the, the heavens. And uh, you saw a lot of blue in the Mishkan in the uh, in the uh, tabernacle out in the in the wilderness, and also you know the, well the tabernacle that <clears throat> traveled with them, and then they eventually settled in uh, Shiloh, and uh, it was it was there for the the Mishkan was there in Shiloh for 400 years. It didn't move. It was there, and then uh, then David wanted to you know move it up to Jerusalem. But anyway, you'll see the colors there that, that talk about the blue, and and uh, it was the color for heaven. Scarlet was the color of sacrifice. The Bible talks about though your sins be as scarlet, um, and then uh, green is the color of life. Well, I mean, surely naturally, um, <laughs> green is you know after a, a rain in the desert. Uh, the desert uh, can can all of a sudden just bloom with green. You can see it here in Texas. I mean, we, if we go through a drought uh, like we did a couple of three years ago and uh, or, you know, every summer, whichever uh, it happens to be, when we get a rain and then two or three days later, I mean, the place is just green as, as anything. It's the color of life. Things pop up. They, they're uh, they're lively. Uh, of course, the color purple was the color of royalty, and we've we've talked about that through the weeks. That uh, um, when uh, when people uh, could or could not wear purple, and uh, how that uh, a lot of uh, you know God was was teaching His people. You know, you're you're priests and kings. You wear purple if you want to. And uh, but we get finally down to white, and color uh, white is the color of purity. Uh, redemption, uh, salvation. Uh, though your sins be scarlet, they shall be white as snow. And uh, um, yeah, you've heard me tell the story in the Talmud where that uh, they would take a cord and uh, uh, dip it in the, on Yom Kippur, they would dip it in the blood of the, the goat that was sacrificed and the uh, 
The other goat, the one that went out of the Azazel, the scapegoat, it went out into the into the wilderness. Uh, but the one, uh, they took this cord and it dipped it in the blood of the sacrificed goat. And then they would take that cord and they would wrap it on the, or tie it to the, the handle of the door to the, um, to the temple. And then uh, they would, uh, during this, the ceremony, uh, that, then they would, uh, they would look at the, that the cord and God would change the color of the cord from red to white to show that he uh, accepted their sacrifices and the, and the sins of Israel corporately uh, were atoned for for one more year. And now if any of you have ever been around um, situations where there's a, a lot of blood, say if you're a, a nurse or uh, in the military in battle, uh, or, or just in accidents or whatever, that um, if there's a lot of blood and you you know get to, you wipe up the blood or you try to stop a, a stop a uh, uh, a wound or you stop bleeding in a wound and you cram uh, cloth in there and and uh, it it soaks up the blood and then it is very difficult if not impossible to uh, get all of that that color or that the color of the blood out of the cloth it stains it and yet uh, the bible talks about you know as though your sins be as scarlet they shall be white as snow and then the the uh, idea from the talmud it was that uh, you know god uh, accepted the atonement uh, the uh, sacrifices for the atonement and it is also recorded that after Yeshua's death and resurrection, the 40 years between then and the destruction of the temple, the cord never again turned white. That God did not accept the atonement because Yeshua was the perfect atonement and uh, that's what was now um, being accepted for, it, uh, for the forgiveness of sins. So anyway, there we that was kind of a, a long way around to talk about these guys being in uh, uh, dressed in white because it's a symbol of purity and uh, so in the bible it talks about the who's going to go to and be in heaven it says those of a pure hands and a pure heart and so these are people who had uh, washed their 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 hands meaning their their actions and their uh their their daily lives were a life of sanctification of dedication of separation unto god their heart was separated unto god and it was it was pure they had you know circumcised of heart i guess you could say and uh, so not only they were physically but they were spiritually set apart and they had endured these were people that uh, we'll find in later on that were uh, that they came uh, through the through the tribulation now it says that they had palm branches in their hands now um the uh, palms where where do you anybody remember where uh, you know the famously where we are going to have where we see people waving palms in the uh, in the bible it just uh you know that there's one that uh, should pop right to mind uh when you when you have uh, palms in your hands what uh, what would that be that was uh that was I think the week before when Jesus came back into Jerusalem and they laid the palms in front of him trying to make him king. Well, that he it. rode that in was... on the donkey and, and yeah, they put the right. palms in front. Of him. That's right. Yeah, that's uh and they were there were uh, there are other places in the Bible, but this is the one that uh, that pops out for most of us that uh, we um we associated you know waving palms. That was kind of a Greek Greco-Roman thing of uh you know waving these palms around and uh um that um you know it, it signified uh, some kind of a victory or of a celebration and uh, so forth um i don't know if the palms that they had back in those days are like the palms that i have in my in my own yard i've got several palm trees that i've been growing that we use them uh, we cut uh, a the part of it uh, every year for Sukkot when we make our own lulafs. 
And um, uh, one of the things that I have to do when I chop those things out is I have to go back then and then strip off these thorns. I mean, they got some wicked, nasty thorns uh, on the spine there on that uh, on that palm. And uh, I promise you that you cannot hold that thing and wave it around any length of time without uh, impaling yourself on those uh, on those little little teeth. They look like little shark's teeth. So that's just a that's just an aside. Um, yeah, that uh, the uh, Pat said that they uh, it was a way to recognize the king who had been away from the city. It was to th uh, put the palm leaves down and uh, uh, he would walk across the palm leaves. So, yeah, it was a sign of of uh, victory and celebration. So uh, these guys uh, in the throne room, they're they're all around uh, the throne of God, a multitude that you can't count. And they're waving these palm branches uh, around. So that would have, that would, you know, what a scene that would have been uh, to, um, you know, I've been in places where I've seen maybe, well, in stadiums, football stadiums or something like that, where there are maybe 100,000 people in there. And uh, uh, that's a lot of folks. But, uh, uh, you know, you could actually see an end to them. They may have been small, but you could actually see uh, to the end of them. And John is saying, you know, you couldn't even see that. No man could count them. So that, what a scene that would have been. All right, let's go ahead. I don't, I don't know how in the world I'm going to get through. Okay. Um, the, the other part, uh, 11 and 12. And the angels were standing around the throne along with the elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might belong to our God forever and ever. Amen. All right, now, um, the, uh, the, it says the, all, all the angels were standing around. Uh, so not only did we have um, these, all these folks that are out there, but then now the the angels have joined in, and how? Who knows how many thousands or millions of those guys are going to be around? So it and uh, it I can I can imagine you know just you got all these people around here, and they're they're all around the throne of God, and they've got their palm leaves, uh, palm branches, and they're waving those things, and then up above them, you know that's the way I would imagine it. Uh, up above them and maybe down below them and all around uh, them, you'd have these angels kind of hovering, hovering around and uh, um, bowing down. It says on their faces before the throne and they worshiped God. It's just, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a hard scene to try to put into words what it would, the magnificence and uh, we we use a word around uh, today that uh, you know is just totally overused and is uh, totally also totally inadequate, uh, and that's awesome. Um, that's it's just you know the idea of it would be just over the top, awesome. Uh, you just cannot describe indescribable would be the how that would be the majesty of it all. And so uh, they're saying um, the, the well, actually, this this verse twelve here is a um, um, it's known as a doxology. What's a doxology? It's a it's a, a, a saying where you're ascribing glory to uh, to the Lord. And uh, so um, the uh, you know the, some of these things uh, that they contain blessing or praise in Greek it's uh, it's a uh, uh, eulogia or, you know from where we get the eulogy and it's what God deserves because of what He will do for His people and uh, and it's a spontaneous act of thanks which men utter when they realize more vividly than ever before their happiness. Can you imagine that these guys that were all around the throne and then all this multitude that uh, these were dead guys. They'd been dead. I mean, they'd already died somehow. 
And so now they're before the throne of God and they are happy. Uh, the word glory is uh, doxa in, uh, in Greek, and it's uh, the honor due to God because of his good reputation, specifically for delivering them, these guys that were all around the throne. Wisdom, Sophia uh, in Greek, is God's infinite knowledge displayed in his plan of deliverance. Uh, in this, the idea of, uh, of the uh, deliverance of mankind uh, through the ages, you know, that started way back in uh, in time. In uh, the first first um, mention we have of a redeemer of a Messiah is in uh, Genesis three fifteen. Talks about how that uh, the seed of the woman would bruise the the uh, um, the serpent and and be victorious over the serpent. And so that's the you know the first instance of it. And then right through there, there's just a um, a, a scarlet thread, as it were, of the the blood uh, sacrifice that that goes all the way through each one of the the, the books of the Bible. And um, if you ever want to get a, a real good view of all of this stuff, uh, pull out a book, uh, find a book by uh, Walter Kaiser. Uh, he has um, um, published a couple of books on on that. And uh, I've uh, I've sat under his tutelage, uh, and uh, what a fine fine fella he is, uh, or is was. I, I I think he's still alive, but it, um, he was one of my yeshiva uh, instructors, and um, he writes a, a real good a real good book here. Let's go ahead and we'll just take a, a quick uh, time to check uh, um, what Michael. Um, Revelation 9 through 17 uh, presents the nations who have aligned themselves with Israel's Messiah. The text in the second half of Revelation uh, 7 absolutely does not continue the John's discussion of the 144,000, nor does it imply replacement of the Jews with the church. Absolutely. Um, such interpretations clearly violates the text of Revelation 7. The 144,000 treated in Revelation uh, uh, 7, 1 through 8 uh, is a separate group from this second group in uh, Revelation 9, 7, uh, 9 through 17. Uh, the, the language specifies the uh, Israelites, Jews. Um, yeah, these, these guys, these 144,000, they were Jews, uh, folks. They, they were Jews. Um, I don't believe that they were a combination of Jews and Gentiles and so forth. These, you know, Gentiles keep trying to trying to get in there, and uh, you know, uh, Gentiles have a perfectly legitimate uh, plan and purpose and place in God's uh, God's whole plan of all of this, uh, you know, eschatology, and uh, the Jews have theirs, and so. Uh, uh, all of us need to be satisfied with where God put us and say, yeah, I'm, I'm one of those. I'm this or that and the other and not, not try to be uh, something that we're not. Okay, um, I don't want to get on that soapbox right now, uh, maybe later. Um, so uh, the language, uh, let's see. Furthermore, there is not an indication in the passage that these Jewish believers have abandoned their Jewish religious beliefs or practices. Nope, they have not. The uh, Jews are, uh, they are Jews and remain Jews. Thank God. The, um, uh, the second group is clearly Goyim. The descriptors, uh, Goyim meaning people from the nation, they're Gentiles. Uh, the descriptors are a vast multiple, uh, multitude that no one can count from every nation and tribe and peoples and tongues. Uh, recognize this group as a distinctly second group of followers of the Messiah. Revelation 7, 9 hints that these uh, Goish uh, people, uh, Goisher people, the Goisher followers of the Messiah have uh, become Messianic Gentiles. The white clothing they wore, the palm branches they waved in their chant appears to portray a Jewish coronation. Good word there, Michael. Um, I, think, uh, I think you're right. I, I look at this, uh, uh, this vast multitude as... Um, 
it, it may also include Jews. I, I don't know. Uh, it has been suggested that coming on the heels of the uh, talking about the 144,000 who were to be evangelists, uh, as it were, in, in the, these end times that God sent them out and protected them so that they could preach the gospel, that it's possibly that um, uh, this is showing the fruit of their labor, you know, the, the vast multitude that no one can count uh, coming from this 144,000. That's, uh, that's been suggested that, and it, and it may be right. Anyway. All right, so um, let's go ahead and uh, look at Revelation uh, 13 through, uh, 7, 13 through 17. Then one of the elders answered and saying to me, who are these dressed in white robes and where have they come from? I said to him, sir, you know. And uh, in other words, he says, hey, meets me. You tell me who they are. Uh, then he said to me, these are the ones coming out of the, the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple. The one seated on the throne will shelter them and they will never go again, go hungry nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not beat down on them nor any scorching heat for the lamb in the midst of the throne shall shepherd them and guide them to springs of living water and God shall wipe away every tear from their eyes. Okay, uh, so John, you know, maybe he's wondering, I, I don't know how that, uh, you know, it's important that he understood who these people were. So, um, but he didn't ask, you know, he's, uh, John is kind of, uh, he's old and he's pensive. He's, he's got a lot, a lot of wisdom now. And then he said, hmm, okay, I wonder who these are, but I'm, I'm just, I'm just going to hold that thought. I'm not going to jump in there. And then, so one of the elders asked him, hey, John, do you know who these guys are? And uh, John, he didn't. He, so he, uh, um, you know, he says, okay, well, uh, the, uh, the elder explained it. And I've, and I've got some typos there i got to fix, but um, um Okay, uh, Michael says he doesn't believe that, that any Jews are included in this second group. Uh, people in this second group uh, are, are like him. And, and it may very well be, Michael. I don't know. Um, I'm, just, I'm just saying that it's just such a, a big, tri uh, big group. And it does say every tribe, every nation, every people. So that would give us a little bit of wiggle room to say, okay, yeah, this is Jews too, um, because... Uh, Okay, where are they represented? There, there's more than 144,000 of them. I don't know where they would be represented. So I kind of fall in the other category that said, yeah, I think that probably this is just anybody and everybody. Uh, so uh, it says the multitude, this, this is the multitude. They were martyred for their faith during the, the tribulation. It says they came out of the, out of the tribulation. They came through it. Um, and uh, it's... Uh, um, and what it does, what it tells me though, is that this is a, uh, you know, this vast number that no one could count tells me the, the horrific scale of death that's uh, going to be taking place during the tribulation. We know that one angel has the power to, uh, uh, take out one quarter of the, the population of the earth. That's a lot of folks. And, um, um. I don't know. Anybody know how many uh, how many uh, folks are uh, supposed to be on the earth right now? I mean, is it like one billion, two billion, three billion? I don't know. I've, uh, it's like four billion, something like that. No, on on is earth right Kathy? now we're close to seven billion. Seven billion. Yeah, right seven. Now. Uh huh. Okay, about seven billion. All right. So if you take away, uh, take about. Uh, a fourth of that, you're talking somewhere, you know, you're talking almost 2 billion people. Now, that's kind of a, a vast number, I would say, uh, that uh, if you're looking out, out across the crowd, you know, you couldn't count 2 billion. And so I, that falls right in line with what uh, John was saying here. So, uh, but what it also tells me, it shows the great depth of God's love that even during this tribulation time that so many people are uh, going to be saved. 
and um, you know that I've heard I've heard people say that. Uh, uh, well, of course, this is the 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 crowd that uh, says that there's going to be that the church, all the believers are going to be uh, raptured at the beginning of the of the rev of the tribulation, and uh, all the sinners and other Jews are going to be uh, uh, left to go through um, um, the the tribulation and God's wrath and so on and so forth, um, but. Um, to, and that they say that because of that, that God's spirit is taken out of the world and uh, uh, that it would be impossible for anyone then to get saved during the tribulation. That once the tribulation starts at whatever that, that you know, at the, at the seventh trumpet sounding or whatever, however they, they decide, I guess the, their idea was that once the church is raptured out, the believers are raptured out, that's the beginning of the, of the tribulation. And that after that, nobody can be saved. Well, if nobody can be saved, why the 144,000? So anyway, what? Uh, uh, somebody going to say something? Yeah. Hey, uh, on the if, if these people are already in front of the throne, right? So yeah. they're before the throne and before the Lamb. So they've already been judged? No, these, these are people who are... Um, are martyrs. I, I guess we could say that this is possibly, um, you know, John is seeing this uh, as a future. This is a prophecy type thing. And um, no, I don't think they've they've been judged as such. Uh, they've they've um, because you know we're all going to come before the Lord and be our works will be judged. But the idea that we were believers, that gets us in the door anyway. That's not our judgment uh, because we're already believers. Once we're in the door, uh, then our works will be, uh, will, will be judged as it, as it were. But we won't be judged um, as to whether or not, okay, are you a believer or not a believer? Uh, God just takes you, okay, you're a believer, you're, you're in. And then, then there will be a judgment for us within the... Uh, uh, the the uh, judgment of the the wicked and the damned that uh, that will be coming after the uh, second coming, and so um, I don't and, I don't know my, if people have been. My assumption uh, is believer means believer in God and Jesus. No, what I'm using when I say believer, I'm talking about a believer in um, in Yeshua Jesus, but that He is the Messiah. And that we have repented from our sins and and uh, uh, accepted Yeshua Jesus as our personal Savior. That's what that's what I when I say a believer. That's what I'm talking. Okay. About, okay. Okay. So uh, okay. So so they were in front of the throne. So we're assuming not heaven, or or the throne in heaven. I'm I'm just what I'm I'm confused at how they got there. I mean, they all have to be believers, and they have to have made it to heaven, and so they had to have been yeah. judged, right, or not? Well, they're okay. They they have died. These are people who have died, and then their souls are taken to uh, to heaven and around the throne room, or or uh, at least where God's throne is. Um, and uh, you know, I I have some some ideas that perhaps. Uh, when we say heaven, uh, what really what is heaven? That's where God is now. Uh, but um, later on, um, uh, when there's a new Jerusalem, you know, a new heaven and a new earth, uh, are, is, is earth, or this new earth, is that the place for, for our humans? And then God comes and <clears throat> tabernacles with us, lives with us in this new heaven and new earth. Um, you know, I, I'm not I'm not really hard over on the idea of uh, uh, you know that we're we're going to go up in the clouds someplace way up there. I think that maybe our heaven might be a purified earth that is going back to the Garden of Eden, which was a perfect world, and we can have a perfect world here. You know, that's um, I would have to do a whole lot more research on that to to really uh, nail that down. But that's kind of my sense of it uh, at this point. Um, let me see what uh, uh, Michael is saying here. Uh, the Great Tribulation 
Revelation 7, 14, where he's talking there. The Apostle John uh, has been writing in broad strokes throughout the book of Revelation, and he deliberately seems to avoid details. Absolutely, he does that. Uh, so when John writes the words, the great tribulation, I don't see him addressing the uh, just the terrible events of the close of the present age. John, I suspect, is sum summarizing the great controversy from the fall of Satan to Satan's destruction in the lake of fire. Uh, but I'm not, I'm not sure of this interpretation. Uh, okay, what's my take on it? Um, well, uh, I've been... I've been struggling with that one this week, uh, uh, Michael, because I, when I was looking at this this vast number, um, I've thought about, okay, when we're talking about the Great Tribulation, you know, Yeshua himself is the one that coined this phrase, the Great Tribulation, in uh, Matthew 24. And so uh, it could possibly mean only those that come in the end of that uh, um into uh, that that time period, let's say that seven year time period, uh, because um, and I think that would uh, would probably be correct because after the resurrection of Yeshua, um, and then uh, you know he says he's the first fruits of resurrection. Um, like Pat is saying here, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Um, so does this include all of those people from the time of the uh, resurrection of Yeshua, that 2,000 years, uh, the, you know, the age of the Gentile, all the way up and in, in to and including um, the, uh, the tribulation time frame? I don't know. It could possibly represent them, and I don't have a problem with, with that representing them. I can see where it could be, but later on in the... Uh, um, um, well, I guess it was in, in uh, verse 14, where they, they said that um, these are the people that came out of the tribulation. And so generally when they're talking about the tribulation, it's talking about the, the you know, that, that uh, 70th week of Daniel, the, the eschatological uh, end of, of the, uh, the world as we know it. Uh, so, you know, I, I could see it uh, both ways. And at the end of the at the end of the day, I don't think it makes a difference one way or the other. Uh, these are people who believed in Yeshua. They've uh, they've been uh, as this were they their clothes. They said they washed them in the blood of the Lamb. So um, I think that we can say that these are people who we would consider. Uh, saved as it were um i know that uh john john really doesn't use the uh, the term uh, saved uh or um uh, you know how we would how we would use it and i've got that uh, somewhere in my notes here um and uh I, when i find it i will pull it up for you but uh um yeah with uh that was back up in in uh in uh, 710 it said john never used the words uh sozo to denote salvation from sin and it's questionable whether he ever, ever used uh salvation soteria in the in this sense either um rather he used it as of as uh of other forms of deliverance um and uh kind of maybe maybe the the uh feast of tabernacles is kind of in the back of uh, john's mind here and uh so this this multitude of people have entered into a feast of tabernacles type of of, of rest um so um anyway that's that's um kind of what what i'm looking at that uh, these these people would um yeah, you know, they're they're the ones that are you know believers from um, the tribulation, but it also could be from another uh, another time. And then Pat uh, uh, says the judgment comes after Yeshua returns to earth the second time. But believers have been united in heaven all along, including during the tribulation. She's talking about believers who have died 
and uh, they have uh, because Yeshua has um, uh, some some part of their being goes to heaven. Okay, because the Bible also does talk about that how the dead in Christ will rise and um, um, meet him in the air. And uh, actually, you know, says dead Christ will rise first. Those of us who remain will meet him in the air. So, um, and there to remain with him. Okay. And uh, any other any other questions, real uh, real quickly here, so we can get. Uh, well, let me finish this off here tonight. Okay. Uh, says, talks about there, those who have suffered so greatly will never again be subjected to hunger, thirst, or scorching heat or sun. So basically all the troubles of this world, all the discomforts of this world, all of the things that these people had to endure possibly uh, at the hands of, uh, of groups like ISIS and, and so forth, that will never happen again. To so these people, they have, they have paid their dues and they will uh, from then on be um be protected and have a great life with the lord it says that that the lamb will lead them to the living water um this uh, this alludes to isaiah 49 and 10 they will not hunger or thirst nor scorching wind or sun strike them for their compassionate one uh, will lead them and will guide them by springs of water and they if if you're in my uh sermon in the tree of life on uh, saturday we talked about the living water the mayam chayim how that uh yeshua said uh, if you believe in me out of your belly will flow rivers of uh living water uh, meaning you know the the power of the holy spirit the power of god living in you so much that it's just going to overflow you like it did the uh the 120 in the upper room that they couldn't contain it they they were just burst forth with with uh praise and and thanksgiving in a language that they didn't even understand so um anyway that's that gets us to the end of these verses and uh we're we're a little bit over time but that's that's okay uh anybody got some other uh comments or or questions along